got you there with got you got you what got you there with Shonda Laney on this episode of What Got You There, I sit down with John Oranger, who is the founder, former CEO, and executive chairman of Shutterstock. He took Shutterstock from just an idea after 10 plus businesses and turned it into the billion dollar publicly traded behemoth that is today. Shutterstock has paid out over a billion dollars to some of its creatives. And if you want to know what it takes to build a business like that, some of the entrepreneurial lessons, what John looks for in founders that he's funding today, this is going to be the episode for you. Make sure to subscribe. John, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me. Yep. I am excited for this one. Uh, you're one of those visionary type founders and, and conquering a lot of different domains. This one's going to be really, really fun. To get started, though, I always love hearing about how people start their day. Are there anything you do the first few hours of your day that you just feel help get you off on the right foot? Drink coffee. Yeah. Uh, mostly, mostly caffeinated. Um, I started uh, cycling a bit though. So sometimes before, uh, if I if I can squeeze it in, I'll I'll, uh, I'll do some road cycling. But besides that, um, I usually get up and go. I'm right there with you. Try to get as much caffeine uh, in the system as possible. I am intrigued though about the end of your day. I, I know you put a focus on sleep. You think it's been helpful. Anything you do to unwind at the end of the day that you think just sets yourself up for the next day? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do try to make sure that I get a good eight to 10 hours, eight to nine hours. Um, I think that's pretty important. I'm, I'm going so hard throughout the day, meeting the meeting, um, that uh, those are important hours. I know, I, I know a lot of people that try to sacrifice sleep to get more stuff done. I, I think that's a bad strategy. I, uh, I've always been a big fan of, of those eight hours. Yeah, I'm right there with you. You mentioned you're charging so hard throughout the day, coupled with tons of different meetings. How do you approach those transitions between meetings? I know a lot of context switching, I'm sure with what you do in terms of investing, what, what your responsibilities are still with Shutterstock, everything like that. How do you make those transitions? Yeah, it's, it, it's hard. The context switching takes some, some getting used to, but uh, it, it's, it's something I've been doing for many years. The, the um, having several irons in the fire has been a strategy since uh, since I was in college, starting my first companies, and um, you, you know, keeping all of your eggs in one basket is always a problem. Um, you need to, even if you're starting a, even if you are the founder of the company, you need to have you know several paths forward and kind of keep navigating between between those th those paths, um, and and that uh, teaches you to get really good at at the context switching skill set. Um, you know, I could be going a half hour deep into telemedicine uh, uh, for one half hour segment and the next half hour jump into uh, a fintech idea. And it's, um, I think it's really important to, to kind of build that muscle. Um, it could be painful, but, uh, but it, it, you, it can be built. Speaking about building that muscle, do you think having those multiple irons in the fire, obviously you mentioned it's a muscle you can develop. Do you think sort of that, that cross pollination of ideas and seeing things in different field actually help you strengthen each specific domain? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, seeing, seeing lots of different businesses, uh, over, over a long period of time, I've, I've been able to, um, kind of understand the patterns between them. Uh, there's ways that, uh, people need to deal with problems. There's ways you need to kind of insulate against, um, against risks in your business uh, and, and looking at uh, different businesses kind of uh, over and over again and switching between them. Uh, I, I think, I think helps uh, you, give you, be, helps you become a better entrepreneur over time. Yeah. Speaking about being a better entrepreneur, I, I know you do do a good amount of investing as well. You mentioned some of those patterns. What is that investing framework like for you when, when you're seeing a, a new pitch, a new business, new entrepreneur, wh what are the, the things you're measuring early on there? Yeah, I'm usually looking for the, uh, I'm usually looking at the person. I'm looking for the entrepreneur. Um, often the idea uh, doesn't, doesn't matter as much because um, most of the time, the first idea the entrepreneur comes up with is going to be different than the one that is actually a success. And I know that from my trials over the years, my failures over the years, my, um, my different, um, my, my journey through, through being an entrepreneur. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the person, um, 
a really good entrepreneur can execute on many different types of ideas. I love hearing that. I'm wondering how much of that comes from your own personal experience. Uh, I know even before Shutterstock, the, what was it, a, a, close to a dozen businesses you had launched prior to that? And, and so it seems like that that curiosity, um, that, that, that own problem solving ability, that's where it comes from for you. Is that why you're looking for that in another entrepreneur? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, that's the thing, you, you know, understanding kind of what the entrepreneur, what excites the entrepreneur, um, it, it needs to be something that um, they need to have some flexibility because often that idea is not going to be the one uh, that works. And I, the entrepreneurs in our, our incubator of sorts, um, I try to explain that to you as well, because if, if, you, if you aren't open to those really hard pivots, you may box yourself into a space that that uh, doesn't work at the end of the day. I mean, Shutterstock was the byproduct of 10 different, completely different businesses. I did not seek out uh, a stock photo marketplace at the beginning, but my journey led me there because that was actually a problem uh, I needed to solve in the rest of my businesses. And that's what I try to teach entrepreneurs these days as well is, um, you know, you're entering a journey, it's going to have these like really crazy twists and turns. You can't see right now at the end of it what the goal is. You have to uh, go through those motions to find that. Yeah, that, that weaving path and not, not necessarily sure what's going to happen here in the future. You mentioned a minute ago about what excites the entrepreneur. For you throughout their, that journey, that, that 20 plus years, what was a continual theme that was exciting you the most? I, it, was, it was that I knew I was getting better and better each time. Um, you know, those, those 10 companies before Shutterstock um, were pretty much failures. They were all companies that I tried, I iterated, and I needed to hard pivot from. Um, they were very different ideas. They all had software kind of backgrounds. Some of them were software as a service business to business. Some of them were consumer products. Uh, this was actually the late 90s when I, uh, the ideas that led to Shutterstock in the early 2000s. Um, but the, the, uh, the trick is the same today. You're gonna, you're gonna enter a space, you're going to um, try your idea, you're going to test the product market fit, you're going to iterate from there. And often where you're gonna to get to, if it is a success, is not gonna be the thing you started with. I think, I think you know, just you, you can study, it, it, it's not always the case. I mean, some people just are amazing at having this kind of bullseye uh, uh, target um, skill set of, of just like picking an industry, going towards it and becoming um, uh, uh, you know, a leader in that field. But that's an exception to the rule. Those, those are, if you look at entrepreneurs and kind of study where they started from, how they got to where they are, often it's, it's, a, it's a very twisted, windy, crazy path. I'd love hearing more about those hard pivots. I mean, any entrepreneur who's been in the fire, they know you're going to face those harsh realities, those really deep truths you got to explore. I'm wondering then when you're working with an entrepreneur now, how do you guide them during those hard pivots where you really make them face that reality? It's... You know, it's, it's a learning process. Like I said, it's the muscle you have to build, right? And, you know, some people are better at it than others. Some people are not good at it at, it at all. Some people after their first, you know, failure will, will go back to getting a job because they'll realize that's not uh, what they're interested in. Um, but the people that kind of learn from it and then take what they learned, test a new idea, and kind of go back out uh, uh, into the world and do it again, each time they get stronger and stronger and you can see it, see it in them. Yes, that muscle just continuing to get developed, continuing to build. One thing I'm really intrigued about, John, is starting 10 businesses before Shutterstock. Clearly your idea generation uh, is pretty impressive, both that you can conceptualize 10 different businesses and then you can actually move forward with it. What, what is that process actually like for you? Uh, it's changed over the years, but today uh, it's literally a spreadsheet with a list of ideas and a list of people that can execute on those ideas. Um, and it's my it's my dashboard. I look at it every day, and I, uh, I I try to just continuously match people with businesses, whether it's 
you know, an entrepreneur that's out of business that they need to pivot from, I can go back to the idealist or it's a new entrepreneur kind of coming into the, the system. You know, how, how can I match them with an idea? I love that. So you've got the two, two categories there. You've got the people in the business. D does it depend? Uh, or I guess I'm wondering what percentage is you have a business idea first, then you're like, this person would be great for it or vice versa, where I have this person, I don't have the business yet, but when I do, wow, that, that puzzle piece clicks in. It's different every time. Yeah. There are, there are uh, people that come to me with ideas. There are people that, that I find sometimes on LinkedIn. I just like their profile. I send them a note. They had uh, no intention of becoming an entrepreneur, but there's something about their background that I think could work. Sometimes they're into it. Sometimes they're not. Um, and I've, I've had people I've worked with in the past uh, that I knew uh, I've started a business with. And I've had people that, you know, I've kind of reached out to completely cold and been interested and uh, I'm on the path. There are several threads right now that I'm on of business ideas and people that I'm trying to match. And one of the things I tell them is that this may not be the one that works. You know, it's, it's a journey. You're going to try this one. It's the exception to the rule that this is going to be the one. This is what I love. I, I feel like we're, we're diving into your spidey sense here. I, I'd be just so intrigued to hear about you. You're just skimming LinkedIn. What do you see? Or even when you're meeting someone for the first time, are there certain things that now you're just, hey, these, these patterns have seemed to, to play out well over time? There's a couple of uh, ways I'm sourcing entrepreneurs today. One is through the uh, people that have been at Shutterstock that have not um, been there for, for some amount of time. Um, and I just remember had an entrepreneurial sense, uh, sensibility to them and, and I reach out to them. Um, uh, some of them are interested, some of them are not. Uh, and it's often the people that I remember were frustrated at the, at the pace of working at a large company. Once you're at, once the company gets to a certain size, it's hard to have that kind of super fast pivot um, out of frustration, right? Like larger companies move pivot at slower paces and that's how they should actually work. Um, if you're at multi hundred person or thousand person companies, they should not um, switch their strategies on a, on a, on a dime. Um, but if you're one person, uh, playing with an idea with a couple of other, uh, you know, engineers or, or whatever, you can literally change pace uh, on, on, on a moment's notice. And I remember thinking back to people that would get frustrated uh, being in a larger company. Uh, and and those, have, those are the people that have that entrepreneurial mindset. Those are the people that uh, I reach back out to that uh, I've worked with in my past that are interested in these types of environments. How do you learn as you continue? Uh, I'm thinking specifically around assessing certain people and then seeing how they play out over time, right? Our, our decisions are blind spots. How do we make better decisions in the long run? And I, I know I've experienced where you're so high on a certain entrepreneur or business idea. And then as it plays out over time, that conviction level starts to go down. I'm wondering how, how you continue to monitor that over time and refine your process. You know, ultimately it's up to the entrepreneur. The, you know, the, these are people that, I'm putting in leadership roles and they know it's sink or swim, right? That's the only way to be an entrepreneur. If, if I'm going to shadow CEO them, it's not going to work. They have to understand they are the chief executive officer of this idea. They're getting some funding. They have an idea and maybe their own, maybe one from our list. Um, but whatever that comes with, they are the ultimate decision maker. I can provide advice, I can provide guidance, I can provide experience, but they are the chief executive officer of that idea. And that's it. And if they want to make decisions I disagree with, I'm going to let them do that at the end of the day. Because there could be something that I don't realize myself. They are deep in that idea. They're going through the motions of of being in the weeds on that idea. Uh, they have to be the ones to ultimately make that, that decision. I can advise them. I could say, I think this is the time. If they don't believe that, they will figure that out on their own. Um, I may not be right, but I can only offer kind of my own experience. And that's part of learning how to be an entrepreneur. They need to make their own decisions. They need to, they're, they're, they're going to have big teams one day if this thing works out and they have to learn how to, uh, be, be an entrepreneur and a leader uh, at the same time. 
Speaking about learning from your own experience, uh, I, I think of you and I, I kind of think of the contrarian. And so doing a tech company in New York City 20 years ago, you, you clearly saw something others didn't. And a lot of people were saying, you're completely off, John. You have no idea what you're doing here. You need to go to Silicon Valley. And that contrarianism is, is playing out today, um, viewing Miami as a new tech hub. I'm, I'm wondering how you approach that and what you're seeing others aren't right now. Yeah, I mean, what I see in Miami is, is, is a great place to live, a great place to work. I think the entire work environment with um, what's happened with COVID is, has completely changed the way we think about uh, location. Um, I, see, I see people that are ambitious. I see a couple of universities that have a lot of, um, a lot of people kind of coming out of engineering uh, and science uh, and math and business backgrounds. Um, I see a city that kind of feels a little bit like New York in that, you know, when I, when I started in New York in 2003, when I started Shutterstock in 2003, everybody was moving away that I wanted to hire. So I had to, I had to find people in positions in, um, in industries that, uh, uh, and, to, and kind of talk them into joining a tech company. They were, you know, maybe they were at a financial institution on Wall Street um, and, and kind of talk them into the upside of being at, uh, uh, a, a tech company with, uh, with equity that, you know, in the future could be worth a lot more than it seems today. I, I think, you know, that kind of environment, uh, you know, I talk about this with a lot of people down here, it's an arbitrage opportunity, right? You don't have as many people hunting down the most amazing people in, in, in uh, Miami right now. So, there, and there's a lot of smart people down here. We find them all the time. Um, and they need uh, funding, they need guidance, they need uh, an ecosystem, and that ecosystem is growing every day. It's not going to happen overnight. Um, you know, people, people are sending me notes all the time asking if the hype is, is real. I mean, I, I don't even, it's not even hype. It's just, this is a, this is a process. It takes time. It's not going to happen overnight, uh, like I said, and it didn't happen overnight in New York. Uh, but I think Miami will be a great place in the future where, where th there'll be plenty of tech companies here that have multi-billion dollar valuations in the future. Where did you develop that long-term thinking, especially in, in a tech type world, right? It, it's short, fast. And for you to be able to think about in, in terms of decades and decades plus, it seems like a, a major advantage for you. I mean, I, I learned the hard way that <laughs> You know, the, 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 you're not gonna, it's not gonna happen quick. I mean, even, even the tech uh, companies that you see go public with crazy valuations today, they didn't start a year ago. You know, it looks like they did, but you know, these are, these are 10, 15 year stories uh, in the making. Um, you know, I think Airbnb was 2007. Um, uh, a firm just went public. I, I believe, I, I don't know their, their start date, but it's, it's, you know, this, this has been, that's probably a decade in, 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 in the in, uh, building that company. I mean, these are, if you want to build something super big, it's not going to happen in one year. It's not going to happen in two years. Um, and those first few years are going to be painful. It's going to feel like you're not making a lot of progress. Um, and I think that's just, you know, how it is. If you're looking for a quick buck, you know, being an entrepreneur is, is, uh, is definitely not the way to do that. Did that mindset for you change over time or develop over time? I'm wondering early in your career, when you, when you were starting these, these 10 businesses, were, were you thinking in terms of shorter time frames? Yeah, I was, I was probably thinking in shorter time frames in the beginning. I probably had, you know, to be an entrepreneur, you, you need to have um, very little patience. Uh, I think what, what starts to happen though, is you start to realize there's a long-term gain, but the, you know, you, you limit your patience uh, intraday but not over a long period of time. So there's like two time frames you're working on. You're trying to get every single thing you possibly can do, get done that hour, that day, that week, that month um, in like really short kind of quick sprints. But you, you have to think about the long-term uh, thing that you're building at the end of the day. John, I love how you articulated that, that two different time frames. I, I think a lot of people are like, yep, he, he just summed up exactly what, what my day-to-day -day is like. I'm wondering how you would take that, and I think of it just in terms of a zoom in, zoom out approach, right? As the leader, you need to be at that 30,000 foot view, but you've got to dive into the weeds at time. I'm wondering how you've done that and developed that over time. Yeah, it's just like you said, you're flying at 30,000 feet and then you need to get down to five feet, get in the weeds, can't be in the weeds for that long because you'll 
you'll miss the, the bigger picture. You have to zoom back out. Um, it's probably the same context switching skill set that we just talked about. You're switching time frame to time frame. You're switching subject to subject, uh, topic to topic, idea to idea. Um, and, and it's like these quick kind of flexible moves that you need. You need to build that like you need to build those twitch muscles. But you also need to build the the, the bigger uh, kind of um, durable uh, marathon muscles as well. Speaking of some of those different skills you have to develop, you said something a minute ago about just kind of talking to people when, when you were launching in New York and, and kind of telling that story. And I feel like it's, that's almost something, and I could be wrong here, that you just glossed over. That seems like a very difficult thing to do. So I'm wondering early on, how much time were you spending on that storytelling element, trying to bring more people into the company as opposed to actually building the company? It was a combination of both. Um, but, you know, the... The uh, the thing that made New York different back then was it didn't have like it didn't have it didn't have this crazy kind of instant tech ecosystem, right? And so, I mean, I remember you know just kind of hanging out with the team for weeks, and it's not like there were tech meetups. There weren't. We just focused. We were on the business. We were on the idea. We weren't focused on kind of some crazy next capital raise. We were just trying to get the product market fit and the unit economics of the business model working. We were trying to get the photographers paid. We were trying to get the, um, the subscription dynamics of the, the buyer working. We were trying to get uh, the, the product that made sense uh, for the, the customer. And then we took the feedback and we did it all over again. And it's just, over and over and over again. And I think, you know, there's something to kind of being in a place where there isn't like this kind of instant template of this is how you work, right? Like you go to Silicon Valley, you, you, Valley, you look for your seed round, you, you, know, you look for your series A, you look for your, um, you know, the second you're done with your series A, you're constantly planting the seed for your series B. Like these are not, that's not a business. Like the business is the idea, the business is the, is the customer, the business is the focus on the product market fit and the, and the business is iterating from there to get even better at what you just did before. It had, it, you know, the fundraising part is not the business. And I think that could be distracting to some people when you know, they, they go to a city like uh, San Francisco or even New York today where it's like, here's the template you can enter and go from uh, you know, C to A to B to C. Uh, you sort of forget about what the actual idea you're working on is. I think, you know, cities that are that, that are uh, just starting, you know, it's it's kind of refreshing view. Like maybe that template's wrong. Like let's create a different one. I think that's um, something that, that that can be done in in an Austin or a Miami or a Chicago. Um, and some of these places are super business friendly. They're uh, they're open to new ideas of, of how this is done. Um, and I, I hope instead of just kind of adapting to the template we have in other places, we can, we can form something, something new here. I think that's essential. Invert, right? Flip the model. Just because how it's done doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean this is how it has to be done moving forward. I am wondering, though, you mentioned the ability just for, for you and the team to focus. Were there little things you did early on that I mean, initially doing them, you might, you were just kind of thinking, all right, we're, we're going to try this, but ended up having these really big fat tails and worked out extremely well in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. One of the big things early on, and I think this goes with just like, it was, it was a New York thing, I think at the time, like there wasn't, there wasn't that much distraction instead of going through big fundraising and hiring all the people I thought I needed, I did the jobs myself. The people in the room with me, the two or three people that were in the room with me at the time working on Shutterstock in the super early days, they did the job themselves. And I think that's really an important kind of lost skill in entrepreneurship is jumping into something you're not good at and just doing it, right? Like I remember the first, the first months, the first year of Shutterstock, I was customer service. I was the photographer. I acted like the buyer. I was UX. I was the programmer. I was the uh, voice of the customer when I, you know, by playing back my own experience on the website myself. Um, and 
those were, you know, I could have gone out and raised some crazy, you know, early round and hired people to do all of that. But I still think back to those early uh, components of the business. I even tried today to show entrepreneurs that's what they need to do as well. I think that's a really important kind of lost part of the, the uh, entrepreneur skill set when you can raise money so fast and just hire a customer service person that, you know, worked at a, uh, a competitor of your own business, uh, you know, they're going to do it like they did it at your competitor. They're not going to do it the way that you think you can do it better because you actually felt the pain and did it yourself. The, the entrepreneurs I work with know I'm lighting up inside because I absolutely love this. This is, a, it seems like an, a lost art at times. I would love hitting on the early days because you were mentioning taking the photos. So you weren't a photographer and then please correct me if I'm wrong on this, but didn't you take and upload 30,000 photos originally to get everything rolling? I, I'd love for you to tell this story. Yeah, I, I, had the, I had the chicken and egg problem that any marketplace business does, business has. Um, I actually love marketplace businesses because they have really strong network effects and I love subscription marketplaces. And I knew this back in the late 90s, early 2000s that subscription marketplaces are, they, they're just so powerful, but they're really hard to start, right? You have this, you have this problem where you're, you know, you can see the business model in front of you, but you don't have customers and you don't have, uh, in my case, content creators, right? And so what I did was I was the first content creator. I went out and I shot 30,000 stock photos and just tried to, you know, put myself in the shoes of what it, what it means to be uh, a stock photographer. I went on competing sites. I found images. Uh, I would hire models and I would shoot the, uh, the, the, the scene, you know, like, you know, people buying things via the web, you know, an e-commerce photo, that kind of every, uh, every business needs. The, the, hap the, the friendly person that wants to answer your call on the contact us page, like wearing a headset, like that person um, I would shoot that person because I knew every website needed a contact us happy person, you know, waiting to receive your call. And this was, these were the super early days of e-commerce, right? Like it was hard to find that image. I mean, today it's, today it's a lot easier and, you know, Shutterstock sells tons of those, but there was a time where getting a model released image was hard, right? And so I, I went out, I shot those, I would, you know, rent studio space, I would shoot them. Um, and I learned kind of okay, I have these images now on my camera. How do I upload them to my own website? You know, oh, here's five or six problems. You know, I would fix those five or six problems. Oh, you know, the, you know there aren't enough keywords for this image. How do I, okay, fine. You, you, know, you need a minimum of five keywords. Like the things I learned by going through the motions, um, we built like pretty much the most efficient upload engine, I think, of any of the, the, the photography sites out there for commercially released photography. You know, when you upload a model release, you know, can you detect whether the model has signed that model release or not? Things like that we were asking ourselves 15 years ago that today, um, you know, we, we take these kind of things for granted. It's called AI, right? But it's called, you know, um, uh, automation. But um, in the beginning, like these were things that I think gave us a competitive advantage. Um, seems silly today that a website wouldn't have these things, but back then, you know, we were ahead of our game, I think, because I personally, and the people in the room with me personally felt the pain of each step so that we can reduce that friction for the actual customers coming in the door. It turns out those 30,000 customers I uploaded created a network effect that you know is today two million buyers and one million creators, and we sell you know four or five images a second, uh, and that took 15 years, 17 years to build. Um, but those early days matter. Those early interactions with your own product really, really matter. Such unbelievable points there. To begin the conversation, you said you didn't. You, there are certain people who are just visionary. They they can see the future. I feel like everything you just said seems like you had, you had some pretty good inclinations in terms of where things were going in terms of what this business was going to be. So I'm wondering in 03, 04, how much did you see in terms of where Shutterstock is today? Um, some of it. I, I mean, the world, you know, it's very hard to predict 15 years down the road. So 
you know, if you asked me 15 years ago what I thought the future would be, I would just have told you, you know, I don't know, but I know Shutterstock will be the place that businesses go to to get their, you know, properly released imagery that they don't have to worry about at an affordable cost with, you know, the most amazing product uh, in, in the industry. And that's, that's you know, a pretty simple statement, I think. It's not, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't crazy. This was some, something people needed. And we, we basically said we were going to be the best at providing this component of what people need. I'd love hearing you describe network effects and just kind of any insights you have and, and what you're looking for, especially when you're assessing out of business. How, what, what, do you, what are the small things you're looking for in, in terms of, does this have a true network effect in it? Well, like I said, subscriptions are important. I think marketplaces are important uh, for, the network, for, for building network effect businesses. Um, literally, literally taking, uh, taking customer interaction and kind of playing it out step by step and creating like discrete pieces of, of, of each step that they're going to be interacting with your website. Um, uh, in, uh, this is kind of abstract, but, but if, you can, if you can visualize those steps and you take each one of those steps and you, you kind of understand kind of the knock on effects to each one of those steps, right? So like take uploading an image um, and uh, how many keywords the, the person is going to provide for that image, right? If you can get someone to provide 10 keywords instead of five keywords, you're gonna create um, more people that find that image, more people that buy that image. The contributor is happier, the contributor will upload more images. These are all individual discrete steps, right? It's like, you know, if you can kind of tokenize it in a way, like each piece um, and what it's worth. Um, and if you can take all of that and kind of get that last step to connect to the first step, you've created a network. John, I think you and I sort of how our brains work visualize similarly there because this is hit, hitting right at home uh, in terms of how you're visualizing that. So I love that. I'm sorry if the listeners are not connecting with this, but this is really interesting. I'm wondering though, as you're thinking that through, do you start from the beginning and go out? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about what Amazon has made famous in terms of backcasting. They start with the end in mind and reverse backwards, almost like you're going to build a movie. How do you approach that? Yeah, the Amazon model, I mean, is, is, is you, you start with the press release, right? Work yeah. your way, way back to the first component of the product. I think you know, we, we didn't describe it that way, but we did similar stuff. I mean, when I thought about kind of in the Shutterstock realm, like what that future state is, uh, it's similar to, to what it is today. I, you, you do need to kind of set the target state and think all those step back, steps backwards. By the way, one of, one of like the, the super interesting um, pieces of the future, I think um, with it, like blockchain is, uh, is actually a super um, important technology here because it is a network effect in itself. Like, I mean, I, and I'm not talking about Bitcoin. Like, I don't know what Bitcoin's worth. I don't know whether I should buy it, whether I should sell it. I should probably own a little bit of it. Who the hell knows like what Bitcoin is? I, I mean, I no, I don't think anyone can really tell you. You can't really use it today. Like it's probably worth something. I don't know how much it's worth. But but if you look at blockchain, like each each individual step in in, in the piece of the blockchain, like links to the previous one and to the next one. Um, and each time one of those little blocks is kind of connected to the end, there's some sort of interaction. Like someone has exchanged it. Someone has done some proof of work. Someone has. Um, uh, received value, someone has provided uh, a service, someone has received uh, some sort of uh, result of that service, right? And so, and, and it actually never ends, it just keeps going, right? And so these kind of like decentralized systems, like what we just saw at Twitter uh, with, with kind of like, like a company deciding, making decisions that are really impactful, you know, combine that with, with blockchain. I think these are, these are like super important uh, pieces of the future uh, that are network effect driven, if that makes sense. No, it does. I, I would love for you even to double click on that. So are there certain things that aren't out there right now that, that you think without a doubt in three, five years, these are going to be prominent? I think, you know, the world's gone back and forth on, on, on these, these blockchain ideas. I think the, the decentralization conversation, I think is coming back. I think it's coming back hard and I think it's gonna it's gonna be 
an important part of, of, uh, of our future. Uh, didn't mean to change the subject there, but I just, when, when, when we're on network effects, I just, these days I'm constantly reminded of that. Please change the conversation as much as you want, because this is giving us a better perspective in terms of how you operate, how you think. So I think this is actually where the gold is. And I'm even wondering what's capturing just a, an inordinate amount of your time right now. Clear, clearly, you, you must be studying certain things to even understand these different concepts. I'm wondering where your attention is going to. Yeah, so I'm really focused on. So I, today I spent half my time on Shutterstock as executive chairman, and I spent the other half on incubating businesses. I have an investment portfolio as well. I make investments in, in companies. Um, most of the time in those, I'm not getting too involved, but in the incubations I am. And when you think about kind of uh, how the world, world has changed with COVID, um, uh, the way people work, the way people uh, live, um, I'm, I'm focused on a lot of those kind of big changes, right? So telemedicine is one of them. Um, there's three or four different ideas in telemedicine I'm working on uh, with, with, with some, uh, of our entrepreneurs uh, in education is, is another way uh, that I think things are going to change pretty dramatically. Like I, I see our child, you know, using Zoom. Th these are to learn. Uh, these are things that you don't just, when everybody gets vaccinated, snap your fingers and like everyone goes back to the way they were before. People are going to be working in different ways. People are going to be, um, uh, learning in different ways. Um, people have gotten much more used to the remote aspect of everything. Uh, and so these, these are kind of these, these big changes that, that I'm looking at for, for the future businesses that, that I want to build. When you're looking at some of these big changes, what, what is that process even like to, to, to ramp up quickly, right? Like you've seen so much throughout your career, you understand patterns, but I'm just wondering when you're trying to tool up and, and understand things quicker, what's that early process like for you? I go in, I, I go in as deep as I can into whatever idea I'm interested in. So I literally find subject matter experts. I use LinkedIn a lot. I find them, I talk to them, I reach out to them. I ask them lots of questions. Sometimes they become people that may be interested in being an advisor or an entrepreneur in one of my future companies. Um, but basically it's about learning, right? So uh, it's just asking lots of questions. Speaking of those subject matter and experts, uh, I'm wondering how much of an impact mentors had for you throughout this journey thus far? Were, were, were you getting feedback advice from mentors or, or were you kind of off on an island by yourself there? I mean, there, there are, there's not like a specific group of people I always go to, but there, there are people that, you know, have, have, have been through uh, different types of business environments that I ask questions to. Um, there are people, uh, when I was, when I was at Shutterstock, you know, on my board, uh, the, the, they were very helpful. Uh, there are, there are executives kind of all over the place. There's no one specific, but um, I've always been someone that asks a lot of questions and that's how I'll continue to operate. Yeah, what, one of the reasons I'm really curious around that is uh, I use mentors, I feel like a lot of times around risk. And I'm wondering how you calculate risk, both as an entrepreneur in your own business, but then also as you're deploying capital into investments, how you think that through. Yeah, the it goes back to the, um, multiple irons in the fire type strategy. I, I, I know for a fact, if there's an idea I have, it's going to pivot into something else. So uh, given that that's a fact, it comes down to the people that are going to operate uh, the ideas and people that are going to drive those businesses forward. Um, so those people need to be flexible enough to be able to pivot. Uh, and so it's literally comes down to there are going to be fewer entrepreneurs than there are ideas uh, in, in my world, at least. And those entrepreneurs need to be able to uh, constantly iterate um, uh, with those ideas because uh, it's about it's about distributing the risk uh, with, with a single entrepreneur that can handle multiple ideas. I think that's the way to put it. Speaking of iterations, uh, I'm always so intrigued about people who are able to scale up businesses. And then, and then for you, I mean, you even ended up going public. I'm wondering about those different growth phases, right? Like zero to 25, 25 to 50, you get to up to 100, 250 people, over a thousand people. 
what are those different stages like? And did you feel there were certain ones that were just more difficult to overcome? Yeah, I, yeah. So I, I, I there's a lot to that. The, I started, <laughs> I mean, so, so when I started Sharks, I mean, I had never worked in another company. I, I was constantly iterating on my own, my own uh, businesses. So, you know, you get to 10 people, you're like, okay, I can, I can manage this. You get to 25, you can kind of, you know, everybody's name still, you can kind of manage that. Um, get to a hundred, you know, suddenly, you know, there's probably someone coming and someone leaving like every month. You get to 250, you don't know everybody's name and there's probably someone coming in, someone leaving every week. Uh, and then, well, maybe not every week, maybe every two weeks, but the, the what I'm getting at is the, the entropy of like the people management uh, part of the, the job starts to get more and more complex. And people who people have, Id have ideas and start businesses, like they don't, they don't know how far they can go on that line. Nobody knows. Um, I got to about a thousand people. I, that was probably a little too far for me. Like I probably should have stopped at you know six or seven hundred and uh, found a CEO like like I did recently uh, to take over. But you you basically need to fill it out because no one knows when that timeline ends and you're like, my skill set has run its course. <laughs> it's very hard to know that from the beginning. Um, look, I didn't know. Like I went public. I ran it as CEO as a publicly traded company for seven years, um, probably two or three years longer than I should have. And happy to admit that. And um, when, I, when I did finally realize it and uh, talk to my board, they were extremely supportive and we found the right CEO. And that's the way these, these transitions should happen. Um, but, but no one, I, I mean, it's funny. No one knows. No one knows how this. Where that where that timeline for yourself will will end. You can kind of take guesses. If you ask me, you know, 17 years ago, how far my Shutterstock journey would go as CEO, I would not have said 17, almost 17. Well, now it's 18. So 17 years when I gave it up. First off, I just love your phrase, entropy of people management. I think about entropy a lot uh, in, in terms of the chaos that that ensues from things and disorder. So I, I love that. But you're hitting on something that I feel like enough people do not talk about, especially successful entrepreneurs and the, those crucial moments for them and, and realizing both where their limits are, but then also what aligns with who they are, right? Like so many people just see what everyone else is doing and, and tries to behave in that way as well. So I'm wondering for you now a little bit of hindsight, when, when you start to feel, you know what, maybe this is pushing my limits. How would you assess that now knowing what you know? Well, today, today it's more about me evaluating uh, the entrepreneurs I'm with and kind of trying to provide guidance for them, right? So a question I often ask them is, uh, like, it's literally, what, what do you think you're good at? What do you think you're not good at? And people, people are not always good at answering this question, actually. So um, the trick of being an entrepreneur, though, is to really start to understand kind of where your own personal limits are. So when I ask that question, uh, you know, I can provide some insight. I could say, look, you know, you're amazing on the technical side. Uh, you know, maybe you're a founding CTO, but you know, we're getting to a place where you kind of need maybe a subject matter expert or maybe some business help, maybe an analyst. Um, it's 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 one of the hardest things I think for people to kind of come to terms with, right? Because they jump into the CEO role and they're doing everything. And then the question is, okay, now you've done everything. What are you going to hire for? Because those are the things you're not good at. And that's, I'm finding actually that's, people are, people are, are not that good at that piece. Um, I don't think I was actually particularly great at that piece either. You learn the, the hard way sometimes. Uh, and, you, and, and the trick is to, to make sure you haven't, gone too far and, and actually caused the company to go backwards before you hire for, for the things you need to hire for in your business, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense. You said that's really hard to both develop and then even assess out. I'm wondering, have you seen anyone really develop that talent quicker than most? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's about, you know, self-realization. It's about realizing kind of what you're, what you're good at and what you're, what you're not good at. 
Um, people, when people get to the, you know, they're, they're people that are either starting out as entrepreneurs and they haven't had a chance to kind of be in environments in, in, in larger companies where they've gotten good feedback as to what they're good at or what they're not. Um, and then there are people who have kind of risen through a specific function, like maybe that maybe they're really good technically or really good business development wise. Um, and they've been taught kind of what they're good at really uh, specifically in that function and they've gotten good at that. But then when you put them in the, the entrepreneur environment, it's a lot of like, it's a lot of tough learning. I mean, I, I don't think there's an easy way to do that, but um, it's a lot of trial and error often, um, I find at least. And you I did my actually long years. You said one of your favorite questions to ask entrepreneurs is for them to assess what they're good at. I'm wondering when you're working with entrepreneurs, what do you feel like they don't ask you enough? Interesting question. Yeah, I find that they're probably, I mean, I think it goes back to what we were just talking about. They're probably not questioning uh, what they're good at and what they're not good at enough because what, what what they've just started to do is is be a little bit of everything. Like to be an entrepreneur, you have to truly be a generalist. Um, they don't often ask me or themselves what they're good at, what they're not good at. I'm finding at least. Um, I think that's a question that as an entrepreneur, you have to constantly be curious about. Um, I think I think it, I think that's it. I think that's the crux of it that exploration of self, that, that kind of never ending battle and game. Uh, yeah. that, that, that's, that's one thing that's really helpful. I, I am wondering though, even like the most talented people that you've surrounded yourself with, is there a particular skill or mindset of yours that you just find hardest to pass on? I'm, I'm always trying to get people to go into the weeds on, on specific pieces, you know, because if you've come from, if you've come from another business and like I explained, like, let's say you're, you're really good technically and you've risen up the ranks technically in, in a business and now you want to be an entrepreneur. Um, you know, the first kind of question, when, when you need to solve some problem, you may ask yourself like, okay, well, who can I hire to solve this problem? If you're, if you're at a startup, you're probably, you're probably, um, by design limited on the cash resource because that's how startups work, right? They're given, they're given little bits of cash until they can kind of prove themselves out and find product market fit. Um, often you have to do it yourself. Uh, and often I'm pushing people to kind of get out of their own comfort zone. And, you know, maybe that tech person needs to get on Google AdWords themselves and launch a marketing campaign, which sometimes is uncomfortable if you've never been a marketer, right? But the amount you're going to learn by doing that is, is insane. If you just hand it off, you're probably, you can, you can be, you can have some blind spots that could be, you know, success or failure for your business, right? Because you're not, you're not in those details. Like, so, so I think I'm constantly pushing people to be in those details, if that, if that makes sense makes perfect sense. It's really cool too. Once you start pushing people towards those, those limits, those boundaries, what they they're capable of. And then when they see that they, they develop that extra confidence and they tend to go towards those even more. Uh, so that's one of the really exciting things I feel like working with entrepreneurs, uh, you've talked a lot about some of the things you executed on. Well, I'm wondering, are there things early on that you just spent too much time on looking back? You're like, wow, that was an absolute waste. I wish I had learned quicker not to do that or not to focus time and resources there. Yeah, there, there's, there are like thousands and thousands <laughs> of things that go into kind of years building up. I, I don't think you can go back and, and kind of kind of criticize that stuff. I mean, for me, look, I, there's probably like, I wish I could have uh, realized some things I wasn't good at earlier, which, you know, you have to, you have to go through the motions to kind of get to. Um, but like I said before, like, this is the hardest part of being an entrepreneur. It's kind of challenging yourself on what you're good at and what you're not good at. Being okay with doing the things you're not good at for a limited amount of time to learn exactly what you need to learn about those things and then finding the right time to hand those things off. That entire process right there is, again, a muscle. An entrepreneur has to, has to learn.
Yeah, speaking of that muscle, one thing I'm really intrigued about to ask you on right now is about the decision to go public and how you thought through that. I, I have to imagine that's that's just like a big, scary, audacious goal that you're going to tackle. I would love to just see how you were thinking through that and then how that was playing out. Yeah, I mean, Shutterstock was, was uh, had solid, predictable revenue. We were growing. Um, I wanted, I, you know, that company... Uh, had a really, in 2012, had a strong e-commerce effort. We were building our enterprise effort. I wanted to build the enterprise effort even bigger. Um, going public was the right decision for, for Shutterstock and continues to be. I mean, you, you, uh, you build a lot of that quarterly discipline that is really important for a company to be the best it could be. And you also uh, get to use uh, the, 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 um, this, the, the public company structure to make uh, to, to be efficient. You know, your your employees start to get some liquidity. Your um, your uh, you can use the equity to to to, to do M and A, um, etc. I think you know as we've seen, you know, there was a theory at one point that these companies would be private forever and just keep doing these private fundraisers. Uh, I think that has been. Debunked. I mean, the public markets are the, the place where lots of businesses um, strive. And sometimes and often it's the beginning of, of the next phase of growth for, uh, for these businesses. Yeah, that, that next phase of growth, uh, you can always see that. I'm wondering, though, are, are there certain things that just being a public CEO, what it's like behind the scenes, people just wouldn't be privy to or never think about? I mean, being public is hard. There's a lot of... Um, you know, you, you can get distracted by certain pieces. There's a lot of um, administrative overhead and there's lots of process. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it makes you a stronger, more resilient company. And my experience with Shutterstock uh, uh, showed that. I think, I think Shutterstock has become that. Absolutely. I'm wondering for you, was there a particular day um, with your time throughout Shutterstock that just brought you the most amount of joy? Yeah, there were, there were several. I mean, going public is, was a super memorable day, you know, ringing the, ringing the bell and watching the first shares trade on, on the exchange. Uh, I think any entrepreneur would tell you that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, that's one of them. But, you know, that event in itself is, is, is amazing. But, um, you know, the the second we got to a hundred million dollars of ARR. You know, I remember that. I remember that pretty clearly. Um, the second we got to 10 million of ARR before that, um, you know, th these are, you know, getting to you know, paying out a billion dollars to our contributors. Like these are, these are big, like great, you know, things that were, that were goals that seemed really hard, you know, in the beginning, but um, were amazing when you get to them. Yeah. Just in terms of paying out a billion dollars to your contributors. I mean, that gives me chills down my spine. I'm not even involved with the company. I'm like, how cool is that, that you, that you created that you did that? Uh, I mean, you've done so much. We were talking a lot about what you're doing, what you're building now. Um, I want to dive more into that in a second here, but I'm wondering just what's driving you behind your daily decisions. You've already accomplished so much, but it just seems like you're still going after so much. Yeah, I just... I mean, the second I try to relax, I get that it, the entrepreneurial itch back. I think it's built in and I don't think it's going away at this point. So I stopped resisting, but, um, you know, I, I probably have a little bit more balance today than I did, you know, back in the early Shutterstock days where I was working 24 seven, but, you know, I'm still, I'm still trying to, to build amazing things. And I think coming down to Miami, you know, this is a new territory for me. It's a new territory for a lot of uh, tech companies. And I think, I think it's it's super exciting um, uh, being in a new place and having lots of new ideas and meeting new entrepreneurs and trying to match them together with ideas, fund them and get them to a su successful place. Um, it's been really fun and I wanna continue to, to do that. So I'm going just, to. Just real quick on that balance. Do you think that you can be the leader of a company early on and get it to what Shutterstock became without that unrelenting grind or do you think you can approach it from more of a balanced perspective? I think I think you can have more of a healthy balanced perspective. I mean, look, when I was those early years, I did nothing but work. Uh, but 
I know plenty of people that you know work hard, have balance, and have successful companies as well. So it's it all comes down to you know personality at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, in the beginning, I it was it was a constant grind of you know just trying to make sure I optimized every minute of every day to make the company the best it could be and get ahead of my competition. It's like what you were talking about earlier, those two time frames, like the immediate right now, long-term thinking as well. Uh, so I love getting that perspective. Talking about what you're doing now, I, I'm sure there's a lot of young entrepreneurs, people trying to build things that have heard this, obviously have looked up to you for a long time. Anything you want them doing just to even get on your radar or, or things they should be exploring or checking out? Well, I think what I would say is, um, you know, we're, we're trying to build these, these businesses. If you want to be an entrepreneur and you're interested in, um, you, you either have an idea or you, um, you want to uh, explore kind of uh, an area and some of the ideas we would have in that area, uh, you can reach out to, to me. Uh, you can reach out to Pareto Holdings, our, our Twitter handle. Um, we have a website uh, up. It's pretty basic, but it'll take, you know, emails. I'm on Twitter. You can find me there. Uh, and these are, you know, I'm, I'm just constantly looking for ideas and entrepreneurs and willing to fund. And uh, I don't plan on being CEO of any of these things anytime soon, but I'm happy to be executive chairman of something that uh, for someone that wants to be CEO, uh, I'm happy to fund it. I'm happy to help. Uh, I'm happy to, uh, to, to do it here in Miami or, or wherever it makes sense. Awesome. We'll certainly have all that linked up. John, this has been a lot of fun for me. Uh, I've learned a lot studying you uh, and then getting to have this conversation, dive deep on a lot of these topics. I am wondering though, anyone dead or alive, if you could sit down, do this, roles were reversed, you're going to sit down for an evening, just having a conversation, who would it be if it's not a family member or friend? Uh, there's so many. Um, I mean, how can I not say, you know, Steve Jobs? Like, how, I never, I, I never met him, um, never had a conversation with him. Uh, but uh, when it, when it, when it, you know, when it comes to his passion for that product and like what that company has turned into, uh, that that would be an amazing person to talk to. About this yeah, that, I, I'd love to sit in on that conversation. But John, this has been awesome. This has been a lot of fun for me. I can't thank you enough for joining us on what got you there. Thank you. This has been great. Had a lot of fun. Great to meet you.